Constructing a Cell, the Assembly Problem. All right, what are the reasons for this lecture series? And uh, I've gone over this before, but let me, uh, let me just say this just in case there's others that uh, um, this is the first video they're seeing. seeing. Why this series on abiogenesis? Well, um, Dave Farina posted a video called Elucidating the Agenda of James Tour, a Defense of Abiogenesis. And you can see in the description box below uh, for a link to that video. And that video was confusing to me on almost every count. Uh, it, was, it was filled with gross scientific inaccuracies. Uh, and so I'm going to bring some clarity to that video that was made by Dave Farina. And the video that I will be referring to throughout this talk, well, most of the videos that I'll be referring to throughout this talk, will be Dave Farina's video. So when you see the timestamp, you'll know where to go in his video to see that quote. And I'll use that for the launch point of discussions. Now, again, I have nothing against Dave Farina as an individual. He seems like a, a nice young, young man, and I don't mean him any ill will. I really don't. Uh, he's a hard-working guy. He puts out lots of videos that help people. I presume he makes his living that way, and I never want to do something to affect somebody who's making a living like that. Um, uh, I just hope to bring some clarity in this. This is not a duel between myself and Dave Farina. Uh, I just want to bring some clarity to a subject that I think that he did not just, he didn't just, it's not just a question of not doing justice to it. He had it all wrong. And uh, this is not a critique of his other videos. I've never seen his other videos, but this one was all wrong. So I'm going to uh, 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 correct his video on that. But I mean him no harm. Um, other synthetic chemists can critique what I'm saying, and I actually invite the critique. I really do, particularly my synthetic organic chemist colleagues and uh, any students that are working in the area of origin of life. Uh, but if you're going to critique something, and uh, uh, say that I got something wrong, you got to give me the reference so I can go back and look and uh, just check on it. Um, you know, that's, that's the way we chemists work with one another. We, we try to give a reference for things that we might say. And also, I want to, I have a larger purpose. I want to show the sophistry uh, of origin of life studies. There's so much that's presented that just isn't accurate and uh, so much that is said uh, that leaves an impression uh, that we're much further along than we are, and I hope to uh, uh, bring some clarity to that as well. And I don't mean any of my colleagues in Origin of Life any harm either. I really don't. I just want to bring some clarity to this field. Okay, with that, let's begin. Uh, in, the, in the referenced video at 19 minutes and 18 seconds, I was quoted, Miller and Yuri took some basic chemicals that are presumed on a prebiotic earth, hydrogen cyanide, formaldehyde, and CO2, and they put those across a, a high voltage simulating lightning, you can get some racemic amino acids out of those. But those racemic amino acids were racemic. Okay, that was in 1952. That was two-thirds of a century ago. What has happened in two-thirds of a century since since Miller Urey in other fields. Well, we've had human spaceflight. We've had, we, we, have, we have satellite connectivity. We have the internet. We have the entire silicon era of, of, uh, of microchips. And, and we have computer technology. We have all of this. In the same 66 years, two thirds of a century, we are still exactly where Miller and Urey were. We make a barrage of stereo scrambled chemicals Nowhere close to even knowing how to make them and hook them together. They got to get hooked together in the proper order. We are clueless on this. And at 20 minutes and 23 seconds, uh, it was stated in response to this, quote, It's not surprising that Jim likes to talk about the Miller-Urey experiment, as it's a classic and a common talking point amongst creationists. This was an experiment in the 1950s that mimicked early Earth conditions and spontaneously produced small biomolecules like amino acids. Jim is correct that this experiment does not in any way demonstrate abiogenesis. All it does is produce the absolute smallest building blocks in living organisms. He is also correct to point out that the experiment produced a racemate of these molecules, not the homochiral mixture we want, or at least that would seem to be the most useful. 
And he is correct to imply that anyone who thinks referencing this singular experiment proves that abiogenesis is a done deal has absolutely no idea what they are talking about. But he then goes on to say, in this video and several others I've seen, that nothing has happened in the field since this experiment. This is totally absurd. Origin of life research is a thriving dynamic field. He must know this because he frequently boasts about reading all the papers in the field to try to understand what's going on. So the claim that there is nothing happening is perplexing and contradictory. There is plenty going on. He just doesn't understand it. Well, I don't remember having said that I read all the papers in the field. I haven't read all the papers in any field. Uh, I read a lot but surely not all. So if I said that, I apologize. I don't presume that I said it, but if I did, show me the reference for that, show me the video where I said that, and I'm apologizing up front because I have not read every paper on origin of life. You know, I find it interesting that someone tries to explain how the pieces formed and came together. Uh, uh, and the person then turns right back to the Milly-Urey experiment, specifically saying at 3623. Now let's wrap things up with an exceptionally brief overview of where we are at with origin of life research. What do we know about how this happened? Well, we can start with small molecules. Everything before that is astrophysics. If you want to learn about how hydrogen collected to form stars, which then fused all the elements in the universe, and then the subsequent formation of planetary systems after enough stars went supernova, check out my astronomy playlist. Otherwise, we can take for granted that lots of small molecules existed on Earth shortly after its formation. The first step from here is to get small biomolecules like amino acids and nucleotides. As we alluded to earlier, the Miller-Urey experiment in the 1950s demonstrated this to be no problem. No problem. Still, with those facts present, I find it interesting when people speak against creationists and speak against creationism because I haven't mentioned any of that in this video and I rarely ever mention that when I'm talking about origin of life and say that the Miller-Urey is a, quote, classic and common talking point among creationists, and then actually use Miller-Urey as a positive talking point for themselves. And how can one take for granted that, quote, lots of small molecules existed, unquote? Who granted that convenient luxury? What molecules are those exactly that ex existed? Where is the explanation as to how that was done? All of these things are being thrown out there. Where is, where's the explanation of where all these small molecules came from? We don't see that. Uh, why is somebody still showing Miller-Urey if so much has been done in the past 68 years? Might it be because it's just as I said, two-thirds of a century, we are still exactly where Miller and Urey were. We make a barrage of stereoscrambled chemicals, nowhere close to even knowing how to make them and hook them together. They got to get hooked together in the proper order. We are clueless on this. What I said in that video is that people go, still go back to the Miller-Urey experiment and we haven't progressed very far. And then in that video, it said that this is a thriving and dynamic field. Origin of life research is a thriving dynamic field. Well, why criticize my points on talking about Miller-Urey when you go right back to Miller-Urey, the experiment that was done in 1952, just as I had said. It was stated in 3650. The first step from here is to get small biomolecules like amino acids and nucleotides. As we alluded to earlier, the Miller-Urey experiment in the 1950s demonstrated this to be no problem. It was said there was no problem at getting these small molecules. No problem? The racemates? No problem? I demonstrated that the enantiomeric resolutions that were referenced in that same video uh, couldn't have been gotten as was claimed. And what if the early Earth conditions were not, were, were, were not reducing but oxidizing as what is proposed now by many scientists? Uh, would the Miller-Urey conditions work? And how do they polymerize? How do you get these, these uh, amino acids if they did form? And even if you did have homochiral systems, how do you get them to polymerize? How can you take that for granted? Because the side chains are more reactive often than the alpha amine. It was stated in, uh, at, at, at 40 minutes and 40 seconds in that video. 
It has been demonstrated that recrystallization of a mixture of amino acid racemates with a slight excess of asparagine caused amino acids with the same configuration to preferentially co-crystallize. You get a solid containing only one enantiomer and a supernatant primarily of the other. All that's left is some natural filtration mechanism to separate the two and the emergence of autocatalysis in one. This is one way that a slight asymmetry can be dramatically magnified. So we can see that the chirality of biomolecules may have been implemented at any number of places throughout the process of abiogenesis. This is wholly inaccurate. I'm not suggesting that the person on the video is lying. Not at all. Rather that one does not understand the very literature that they themselves are citing. I explained the very misinterpretation in the homochirality video in this series. There is not predominantly one enantiomer in the solid. It was a very small amount, as was stated. It has been demonstrated that recrystallization of a mixture of amino acid racemates with a slight excess of asparagine caused amino acids with the same configuration to preferentially co-crystallize. You get a solid containing only one enantiomer and a supernatant primarily of the other. But, this, but in reality, the very paper that cited showed, quote, less than 1%, unquote, of the mixed crystals consisting of the one that, that the author wanted in a maximum EE of 22.3%. Follow the chemistry and track this thing down. But I'm looking at it and trying to track it down. So here's a cleaner copy of it. And here's what you find. They used a 700 weight percent excess of asparagine was used, not a slight excess as was claimed. And then here's a quote from this article, quote, less than 1% of the mixed asparagine phenylalanine crystals consisted of phenylalanine, and the maximum EE of the phenylalanine was 22.3%. So in other words, less than 1% of the crystal that formed of asparagine contained phenylalanine. That's not the way it was portrayed in that article. Less than 1% of it. So you have 99% asparagine and less than 1% of the thing that you wanted crystallizing on it, phenylalanine. And you don't know what less than 1% means because he should have told us how much, but he just said less than 1%. Less than 1% could be 0.1%. It could be 0.01%. It could be 0.00001%. We don't know. But when an author writes less than 1%, it just means it's terribly, it's terrible. But he never told us how bad. And, and, and uh, we don't know what, what, if it says maximum EE, what was the average EE? What was the common EE that was gotten? And at 1% of what they wanted in a mixed crystal. So there's only 1% and, and uh, less than 1% and more than 99% of something else. That would mean that you just get a very small amount of what you want, and it's only 22% EE. That's far from homochirality. And what that would mean is that, that this solid containing only one enantiomer and a supernatant of the other. You get a solid containing only one enantiomer and a supernatant primarily of the other. That's again untrue. If you look back at that very paper that these people published, uh, uh, the supernatant would have been racemic to within the error of the measurement. If you have less than 1% at 22% EE that is crystallized out, the, the supernatant is racemic. The data interpretation in that video that I'm citing was utterly incorrect. You can't solve the homochirality problem. The Miller-Urey didn't solve this. So notice in the reference video, the very literature that was cited was grossly misinterpreted. So he's dead in his tracks. Small misinterpretations might occur, but this was an enormous misinterpretation. Hence, this cell assembly story is stopped dead in his tracks. And the story should just stop. It should stop right here because he can't solve this part. Every slide was wrong. There is a notable advance in attaining homochirality by autocatalysis that should have been cited in that video, specifically the work by Donna Blackmond and Neil Hawbaker. So Professor Blackmond is at the Scripps Institute and she has studied in great detail this reaction. This is asymmetric ampli amplification induced by the SOAI 
autocatalytic reaction. This is an asymmetric amplification in a reaction catalyzed by its own product. And so you see this, this compound here that it's catalyzed by its own product. And it's an amazing reaction. <clears throat> Professor Blackman discusses how the homochirality of biological molecules is a key feature of informational polymers, RNA, DNA, and proteins of, on which life is based. Theoretical models and experimental studies aim to rationalize how one enantiomer of a molecule might have emerged over its mirror image in a prebiotic world, presumably in the absence of a chiral bias. The discovery in 1956 of asymmetry in the weak force led to the concept that enantiomeric molecules, long considered to be identical in every, res in every respect except their mirror images are non-superimposable, are in fact minutely different in energy due to parity violation. The parity violation energy difference, PVED, has been postulated to account for the original imbalance in enantiomeric molecules, leading to the observed biological enrichment towards L-amino acids and D-sugars. This stands in contrast to many origin-of-life proposals that say that the direction of symmetry breaking may have occurred purely by chance from random chemical fluctuations. But after more than 25 years since the discovery of the COI reaction, that reaction remains the sole documented example in which amplification of a small difference in enantiomeric excess in the autocatalytic reaction can lead to a homochiral population. This is the sole example. <clears throat> and in over 25 years since that, the discovery of that reaction, nobody's found another one. Now I am reading directly from Professor Blackman's paper that was published in 2019 in the journal Nature Chemistry. Quote, the COI reaction remains the only confirmed case of chiral amplification in autocatalysis, and its chemistry is not amenable to an origin of life scenario. No reactions involving chiral molecules under prebiotically plausible conditions have yet been discovered. In the absence of such a mechanism, the propagation of an imbalance of enantiomers from PVED may be seen as an even more challenging proposition. Furthermore, in contrast with early calculations suggesting that the weak neutral force would favor the ter terrestrially dominant L-amino acids, Quack has concluded from extensive later work that theoretical calculations provide no direct relationship between PVED and the hand of a chiral molecule, as would be expected, for example, from the Deleg postulate for an L-amino acid world. It is important to note that the SOAI reaction is itself a singularity, not only in its to date unique capacity to amplify EE, but also in its stunning autocatalytic efficiency and persistence." Unquote. So this is what, what, uh, this is what she cites. This is what she writes in her own paper. Then, when you go to the experimental section, in the supplemental procedure, you can see that she had to buy the, the aldehyde, and then she purified it by column chromatography, and then further by distillation. So there were distillations involved, and there were column chromatography. It has to be highly pure. Remember, in that video, they cited a reaction where something was less than 1% of it was the compound you wanted. 99% of it was something else. This is highly pure. You see the, the extreme conditions that have to be realized if you're going to have amplification and autocatalysis. And they used diisopropyl zinc as the, as the standard reagent to use. Diisopropyl zinc is pyrophoric, which means it bursts into flames in air. I've used dialkyl zincs, and they are hot. And if they touch water, you just get a ball of fire. In air, you get a ball of fire. So they use diisopropyl zinc and they use toluene, which is not a, a, a prebiotic solvent. And the toluene was purchased in, in a super anhydrous form in an Aldrich Sure Seal bottle. So they had to keep all water out of this. And they used a serum vial that was flame dried, it says, and back flushed with argon. Where are you going to get a flame dried vial? A flame dried vial that is flame dried so you get all the water off of it, then you backfill it with argon. And then they used a sterile needle 
and they had to maintain the reaction at minus 12 degrees centigrade. So think about how exacting these procedures are. And this is the singular case. So Professor Blackman remains refreshingly circumspect in her analysis of her own data and in the projections that she makes regarding implications for origin of life. I wish more researchers were like her. She is refreshingly circumspect in her analysis and in the implications of origin of life. And you can hear her in her own words on, her, on a video that she did recently on her work. So um, basically, we can calculate the, the energy that from this EE value, just the same way that you, you could look at you know, delta delta Gs for any uh, asymmetric reaction. And it turns out that it's about 2.8 times 10, 2, 2 times 10 to the minus 8 kilojoules per mole. And um, if you uh, compare that, remember we talked about parity violation energy difference, that's 10 to the 12th to 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the minus 12th to 10 to the minus 15. So we're still orders of magnitude away, which would suggest that um, parity violation energy difference wouldn't be enough to uh, tip us one way or the other. It certainly isn't enough in our chiral world today to make any difference to any of the reactions that we're doing. But there are people who have models to show how you could still you know, pull signal out of noise if you have enough time and enough, you know, uh, 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 small values of alpha. So I, I, I think that my, con I'm just going to go straight to the conclusions now. Um, the this probably PVD is unlikely to be su su uh, sufficient to account for symmetry breaking, at least in the SOI reaction that we studied. Um, and you're going to need a reaction like the SOI reaction, but very persistent and very efficient if it's going to reach homochirality. And so far, the SOI reaction is the only one we have. Um, it's maybe more likely that we have to think of some combination of processes, not just a single autocatalytic reaction that would allow, would get us to, to homochirality. Um, so that, uh, and, and along those lines, um, a lot of people, we, uh, our group included, are trying to find more prebiotically relevant reactions that could do what the SOI reaction does. So far, we haven't been able to find one. So that's a kind of a holy grail for anybody that's interested in thinking about what kind of reaction that would be prebiotically relevant where the product could then make itself and amplify uh, EE. She has done terrific work in advancing this area, and maybe we can interview her on one of my future podcasts to hear more about her work. But that video goes on and just presses on ahead. At 3739, it was stated that nucleotides form from simple molecules like formamid. All right, well, how do you get those that he's, what he's drawn is not a nucleotide, but a nucleoside, I believe, but that's minor. Um, uh, but how did he get that proper stereochemistry? What's shown in this picture is the proper stereochemistry. Uh, uh, nucleotides, it says, it's written, form very easily. They don't form easily. Let's look at, at what experiment he might be talking about. So here, here is, uh, let me get my laser pointer here. Here's uh, formamid. Here's formamid, what he's saying, and he's saying we get to here very easily. Does that look easy, easy to you? Look at all of these steps you got to go through to get here. That's not easily done. This was done in a modern laboratory with many steps that are really hard, which we're about to see. And they did the relay synthesis problem that I spoke about many times where they will make a product and never use that product but just buy it. And what they made was racemic. It was racemic. And it was not even diastereomerically pure. The preparation. So we're going from here to here. <clears throat> Here's one of the steps that you got to go through. You have to ma make uh, uh, acrylonitrile. And then you have to make this amino propionitrile. Just look at the process on this. The preparation of the cyanoacetylene on copper one was suggested as a way to conveniently uh, prepare and store it for, for use when needed. Copper chloride was mixed with potassium chloride to generate the Newland catalyst at 70 degrees. Then a separately generated source of acetylene gas was prepared from calcium carbide and water. Was there really calcium carbide on the early Earth? I've never seen that. Maybe there was. I have no idea. But usually that's made by putting a carbon source <clears throat> across a very high potential. Maybe there was. But somehow you have to have water dripping on that <clears throat> and that gas then bubbling through the solution that you want. 
How does that happen on an early Earth? We don't know. The gas was bubbled through the Newland catalyst to prepare acrylonitrile, which is an unstable molecule that needs isolation and storage to inhibit its polymerization, which was then subjected to potassium cyanide for one hour. Then five equivalents of ammonia in a 13 molar ammonia ammonium solution was adjusted to pH 9.2 with sodium hydroxide to generate the desired amino propionitrile. So that's going from here to here. All of these reactions were executed in clean vessels and properly isolated prior to proceeding to the next step. This is just a sampling of the preparations that are difficult even for the most skilled synthetic chemists, preparing very simple precursors to a few of the many molecules within the building block class. And all of their precursors were racemic if they bore any possibility, any possible stereoisomerism. This is what he's referring to when he says formamid can go to, to, uh, uh, can go to the, these nucleotides. That's what he's talking about. Does that look easy to you? Just one step, boom. Oh, that was, that happened. Oh, really? Formamid just does that. How does it do that? How'd you get that chiral sugar, that homochiral sugar? How was that done? Because remember, a nucleotide has got to have, uh, in it, in it has got to have, it would have a phosphate out here, but it's got to have this being chiral. It's got to have that sugar to be there. How does that happen? Never explained. So he's dead in his tracks again. And further at 3756, he says, So getting the smallest building blocks of life is absolutely no problem. Whoa! Getting the smallest building blocks is absolutely no problem. Any origin of life researchers out there? would like to come on, you can come on my YouTube channel with me and go, he go ahead and justify that statement. Are there any synthetic chemists out there that would, that would be able to, to justify that statement? Show me where you've published papers on origin of life. You come on anytime and, and talk about how you could justify this statement that getting the smallest building blocks of life is absolutely no problem. I don't think any of them would take me up on this. That is a total misunderstanding of, of, of uh, chemistry. Again, I'm not picking on anyone else's other videos. I'm just saying this one was so wrong. This is wholly in inaccurate. All right, the story is dead in its tracks. Uh, uh, you know, an origin of life researcher publishes a paper and there's a lot of hype around it. The press then hypes it up even more and, and uh, people just don't have the ability to go back to the primary literature and look at this and analyze it. Uh, uh, there's poor relative stereochemi stereochemical control. Diastereomers were forming all the time. There's no absolute stereochemical control, so there's no homochirality. It was all racemic. There's no accounting for the mass transport through the sequence. How do you go start at a certain amount and take it, take it several steps? They don't. They just go one step. It's a little blip in an HPLC. They say, oh, we got it. And then they buy the, that pure compound and they, they, they take it on to the next step. Uh, a prebiotic earth would have none of these luxuries. An origin of life researchers strap an early earth with burdens that they themselves would never be able to bear. And the layperson, like in the video, are summarily misled. The storytelling should stop right here but it presses on. More storytelling in that video we're referencing. Even though the video suggested at 3756 that getting the smallest building blocks of life is absolutely no problem. It relies on panspermia. 3742, quote, and we have even seen spectroscopic evidence of these and other biomolecules existing in space, which offers the possibility of them arriving on Earth already made, a version of the so-called panspermia hypothesis. Well, this just begs the question, how do the molecules form? The periodic table is the same throughout the entire universe. Throughout an entire universe, it's the same. So regardless of molecules being in space or not, how did they first form? How did they form in the first place? We're talking about origin of first life. How did they, how did they form? So just because they're out there in space, we have to be able to say, how did they form? How does this happen? 
We'll talk more about this later on in this video. And don't give me this nonsense of, quote, spontaneous assembly. Molecules form mechanistically regardless of the speed at which they form, the rate at which they form. They can be spontaneous. There can be spontaneous non-covalent self-organization of molecules. But when it comes to covalent molecular synthesis in this context, spontaneously is the origin of life researchers code for, quote, I don't have any idea, unquote. So when they say it formed spontaneously, it means they, they, they have no idea how it formed. If they're, t if they're talking about forming spontaneously something like this, they, ha they have no idea. They would have to show it. It would no longer be spontaneous. If they knew, they would show how it formed. When they don't know how it happens, they say, this formed spontaneously. Well, show me how that happened. You can't throw around that term lightly when you're talking about covalent molecular bonds. I'm not talking about orientation of molecules in a self assembled monolayer, for example, or in a lipid bilayer. I'm talking about the covalent bond. Show me how that happens. Don't use that word spontaneous because it's your code word for I have no idea. And then there's the sleight of hand. Are you forgetting something? What about the monomeric sugars? So when you said getting the smallest building blocks of life is absolutely no problem. You never talked about the sugars. Why? Because there's not even a good story on that one. The storytelling should cease right here. You can't make the sugars. You can't make your RNA. You can't make your DNA. It should stop right there. Show me a prebiotically relevant synthesis of sugars with any, any possibility of getting homochirality. Show me that. When you can't, the story should have stopped right there. It's as if one wants to build this car, but all he's got is rocks. You know, there's the car, and you say, make that car. You know, all you got are the rocks. From those rocks, you got to get, you got to get all the chemicals. You got to get the, the, all the metals. You got to get all the, 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 the chemicals to make the tires and the seats. And, and uh, you got to get aluminum from aluminum ore, you get, you, from, from bauxite. You have to get the, the, the copper ore. You have to get iron ore to make the steel. That's what early earth is faced with. You can't buy these things. Remember that? We talked about that. So when you say in the video, getting the smallest building blocks of life is absolutely no problem. I don't believe that those that say such things really know what they're talking about. I don't believe it. You don't know what you're talking about if you're going to say something like that. And then you have to address the polymerization problem. So his step two, the video step two is polymerization, polymerization to get the biomolecules. But remember, they never established the monomers to begin with. They never established these. They never showed how to make the sugars. They never showed, showed how to make, therefore, the nucleotides, because you couldn't make the sugars, in any prebiotically relevant manner. Uh, they got the amino acids, but now you want to get these things to polymerize? Remember, they have side chains. There's side chains here. There's lots of hydroxyl groups here. You, you have the, the, the uh, uh, C2 hydroxyl here. How do you get these to polymerize when those are unblocked? You can't just say these make DNA or RNA. You can't. In, in fact, you, you got the extra sugar here, so the, uh, the extra alcohol. If this is going to make DNA, it shouldn't have that alcohol. But in any case, it's a minor thing. How do you get these? You got to have the side chains protected. In 3759, it's proclaimed in the video. Next, we need polymerization. DNA, proteins, polysaccharides, these are all polymers. So some mechanism must have arisen to join the small bits together. There he goes. Some mechanism must have arisen, unquote. In other words, he has no idea. But because we are here, there must be some way. So let's claim that we know rather than confessing that we're clueless. If we're here, we got here somehow. So we pretty much know how it happened. No, we don't know. We don't know how it happened. This is what you're supposed to tell us. You're supposed to tell us how these things polymerized, not to say, well, it must have arisen. No, you're here to explain to us how it happened. That's the whole thing about explaining abiogenesis to us. You can't just say some mechanism must have arisen. Well, yeah, somehow we're here. What else would you like to like to claim? You know, I, I, are you are, are you presuming something? Are you suggesting an intelligent designer or something? I don't know. What's the sum mechanism? How about explaining that to me? The whole purpose of the cited video was to show us. 
the, the video never showed us how to make the amino acids and the sugars polymerize. Never showed us. Never showed us how to make, make the, the RNA polymerize. He's going to show us, but we'll tear that apart. All right, so polymerization to get biopolymers. So he's going to take this, this uh, uh, nucleotide now, and it is suggested at 3811. This likely happened first with ribonucleotides, as these have been demonstrated to polymerize on hot clay to produce RNA. Well, if you're going to use a ribonucleotide, where did you get the ribo part? Where did you get the stereochemical homochiral sugar, ribose? You can't have the ribonucleotide till you have ribose. And, it has, and, it, and if it's not homochiral, it's not ribose. You have to solve the homochirality problem for that. Yet the video skips the point via fast talking. The story should end here, but he presses on. And he says, you get these polymers on hot clay, so you can take a, a RNA nucleotide, a ribonucleotide, and you can put it on hot clay and you can make RNA. These have been demonstrated to polymerize on hot clay to produce RNA. Oh, really? Hot clay? How hot? I'm wondering, how hot is that clay? Well, is it hotter than minus 80 degrees centigrade? Is it warmer than minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit? You go right back to what's published on the Sigma Aldrich page for, this is a company that sells RNA. RNA from the website uh, uh, tells us that RNA is much less stable than DNA due to its chemical structure. RNA is subject, su subject to autocatalysis as well as degradation by RNases. Well, there's no RNases on an early earth, so we don't have to worry about that. But this is what we got to worry about, that hydroxyl. That, that two hydroxyl, that hydroxyl and the two carbon coming and attacking that phosphate and whoops, there we go, broken RNA. Well, how does that happen? What, what, at what temperatures does that start happening? Uh, above minus 112 Fahrenheit. The two hydroxyl group of RNA can lead, I'm quoting, to autocatalytic degradation, quoting from the website of the company that sells this stuff, which in turn, under the right conditions, lowers the quality of the useful oligonucleotide. For short-term storage, single-stranded RNA nucleotide should be stored in a TE buffer. We showed the structure of that buffer before at minus 80 degrees centigrade. So it's got to be in a buffer kept at minus 80 degrees centigrade. That's what you got to do. But you want to make that on a hot clay? How well would it be made on a hot clay? And what kind of clay did they use? Well, let's look up the paper. Let's look up, let's go to the primary literature and see what they used. Here's a paper, Prebiotic RNA Synthesis by Montmorillonite Catalysis. And, and uh, so they start with vol clay, which is a commercial clay, which might contain other additives. I went to the website to really understand what is vol clay. Is it, is it clay that you've gotten that you sell in its native state, or have you pre-treated it? I don't know. It may not be native clay. Why don't you just go out and, and find some clay and try this? Well, they didn't just take vol clay and do this. Look at what they did with vol clay. It was treated with 0.5 molar HCl 50 mLs by continuous stirring at 4 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes. At the end of each treatment, excess acid was removed by centrifugation. Where'd you get a centrifuge on early earth? And decanting the supernatant. Fresh acid, 50 mils, was added, and the Montmorillonite pellet, and the treatment was repeated twice more. The acid treated, that's H plus Montmorillonite, was washed with 100 mils of deionized water at 4 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes with constant stirring. So we're going to have this clay where it can get to 4 degrees centigrade, and then later it's going to get hot. Interesting. At the end of the washing, excess water was separated by the centrifuge at 3,500 RPM. Were you going to spin something at 3,500 RPM on an early earth? And decanting of the supernatant. Washing with water, 100 mLs, was repeated three times. The protonated montmorillonite slurry was added to water, 1,000 mLs, and to this was added 45 mLs of wet anion exchange resin. Where do you get an anion exchange resin on early earth? Hmm? To remove the residual HCl, <clears throat> the mixture was stirred for 30 minutes. pH was measured at 3.0 plus or minus 0.2. The anion exchange resin was removed by filtration using a stainless steel sieve. 
amazing early earth, and the protonated Montmorillonite slurry was removed and freeze-dried. One gram of the protonated Montmorillonite was suspended in 100 mils of deionized water and titrated with 0.02 molar sodium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide, or KOH at pH 7. The water was separated by centrifugation at 3500 RPM, there's that centrifuge again, and lithium, sodium, and potassium Montmorillonite pellets were freeze-dried. Wow, freeze-drying, you need a vacuum pump for that. I wonder where that, how that happened on an early earth. That's the clay that they use. It's not clay that you got from under a rock. <clears throat> then you can't just use the nucleotide that you showed us. Can't do it. Mm -mm. You got to use an activated nucleotide. So you got to have an imidazole to activate this. Now look at how he got that imidazole on there. So there's the nuclear base, nuclear base, there's the ribose, none of which was explained in the video how we could get those. And here's what you had to do to put that imidazole on there. What he did is he took a mixture of the five mononucleotide amp, he calls it, and imidazole, which he bought, <clears throat> and dissolved that in DMF. Where do you get dimethylformamide on an early earth? And that's a human-made solvent in 50 mil flask and the solvent was evaporated to near dryness at reduced pressure. Where'd you get that vacuum pump? The evaporation was repeated twice with DMF to remove residual water. And then again, it says he used DMF, used DMSO, that di dimethyl sulf sulfoxide, that's another human-made solvent. And then 2,2 prime dithiopyridine, where do you get that on an early earth? And triphenylphosphine, where do you get that on an early earth? It's easy to these days, you just order from the manufacturer. And then he used triethylamine, that's T, T-E-A, triethylamine. Where do you get that on an early earth? The resulting product was removed from the clear yellow reaction mixture as a precipitate by adding the reaction mixture drop by drop to a solution of sodium perchlorate. Hmm, quite a chemical store on early earth. In a mixture of ether, acetone, and triethylamine stirring at the same time. Ether is human-made materials there. I mean, it's, the stirring was continued for two hours and it goes on and on. He uses centrifuge, he uses ether, he uses a vacuum desiccator, and uh, then he gets his, his more than 99% pure uh, uh, material by HPLC. So he had to get it really pure. How do you get things really pure on an early earth? You say, well, it doesn't matter. No, it really, really matters in this sort of thing, because these are condensation polymerizations. These function under something called the Carruthers equation. If you just have a little bit of mess in there, that terminates the polymerization. So you had to use really pure material here, purified on an HPLC. How was that done on an early earth? It says in the paper, wide ranges of activating groups are produced from hydrogen cyanide under plausible prebiotic earth conditions. Well, why didn't you use those to show us that? Why not? Now, Nucleobases can form under prebiotic type conditions, but again, this is often using the relay game, which we've explained before. And then they, 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 these are the reactions, so they put it on the clay and they do all of these things. All these things in red are very exacting conditions, very exact. It's all very exacting, you know, 24 degrees, this, 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 this. And then finally, when he's done, just go right here. It's just he had to extract it four times with, 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 with uh, an organic solvent, all right? Acetonitrile, he had to extract it with acetonitrile. So he had to get that solvent and extract it with it. Why did he have to extract the, the RNA from the, the clay with an organic solvent? Why didn't he just wash it off? Because it doesn't just come off. Because the, the, the RNA is negatively charged, the clay is positively charged, and it sticks. And it doesn't come off, it doesn't give it up. So what does he do? He, he treats it with, with, uh, acrylon with uh, acetonitrile, um, and he does this, does this over and over again, overnight, just with this organic solvent. So this isn't prebiotically relevant anymore. It has no relevance. How can you claim this? It has no relevance anymore. But even we'll give you that. I'll just give it to you. Now look what happens. Bridging the prebiotic and RNA worlds. Prebiotic RNA synthesis on clay. So these folks did a, a synthesis on clay. And what they tell us, thankfully, is they tell us how well it polymerized. You see here, here's the two prime hydroxyl. 
here is the three prime hydroxyl. You need it to polymerize between the three prime hydroxyl on one and the five prime hydroxyl on another to make RNA. But there's another hydroxyl there. So if you were to do this in a modern laboratory, you'd have to figure out some way to block that hydroxyl. But when you don't block it, look what happens. You get both the three prime, five prime polymer and the two prime, five prime polymer. And that's when you have really pure monomer that's purified like through an HPLC. And so you get, you have to use these activated systems. So you have to use the activated monomer where you put the activation group on here and you get two prime and five prime linkages. Well, how much of those do you get? Well, you get a lot. So you get 67% of the three prime, five prime. So that means that, that uh, uh, the other 33% is the two, is the two prime, five prime. Here, uh, when, when you use these other oligos, uh, when you use these other monomers, you get a predominance of the two prime, five prime. That, that, that will be the predominant one. So you get all sorts of messy linkages. Let me show you what that means. Here's how RNA should be. You get this three prime hydroxyl coupling through a phosphate to the five prime position of the next one. Three prime to five prime, three prime and on for, on, onward to five prime. That will make you RNA. If you had the homochiral base, uh, the homochiral sugar, which he didn't have. And if you could somehow put those together, then you could polymerize these to three prime, five prime to make RNA. But you don't just get this. You get a lot of the two prime, five prime, uh-oh, two prime, five prime, lots of it, at least 30%. And then sometimes the predominant is the two prime, five prime. Then you don't have RNA. That's what I'm talking about. You've got to protect those other side chains to be able to do this. This was never addressed in that video. Rarely addressed in Origin of Life uh, uh, um, articles. They'll take, they'll take this, this RNA nucleotide and they'll throw it in water and they'll say it polymerizes without ever looking at the two prime hydroxyl attachment. Well, what happens if there are two prime, five prime attachments? What would happen? Oh, look at there, look at there, what, what's happening? Look what happened. You make siRNA, the two prime, five prime linked nucle nucleic acid exhibits very unique hybridization properties to complementary RNA. While the two prime, five prime linked nucle nu nucleic acids form a stable duplex with RNA, they weakly hybridize or not at all to the complementary DNA. Well, that's, that's interesting. The duplex is formed between the two prime, five prime linked DNA or RNA and the three prime, five prime RNA adopt an A form helical structure. This suggests that these duplexes may, may be used as siRNA to inhibit gene expression. They are, they form siRNA. What is that? Small interfering RNA. siRNA degrades messenger RNA after transcription, preventing translation. These are products which shut the biochemical process down. They shut it down. The impurities there shut it down. This is what I'm talking about. You get all these impurities and they shut down the process. The process is shut down by these impurities. You say, well, you don't even address those. Why didn't you address it in the video? Because I think the people that made that video didn't even know this because they don't read the primary literature. These are the problems. And there's no, are there no alcohols or sugars or amino acids or thiols or amines around during this polymerization? Because they would surely attack those phosphates. In every case, there would be interfering nucleophiles. How is that done on an early earth? In a laboratory, you can use pristine solvents and get everything HPLC pure and try to pull this thing off. And even with that, you get a lot of two prime, five prime linkages. And what you get are only short SIR, only short RNAs to begin with, number one. Number two, if you had any interfering other nucleophiles. And now, later on, when you want to do, when, when you want to make proteins, you subject it to all the 20 amino acids, all of them. But here, when you just want to make the RNA, siRNA, there's no amino acids around. How convenient. Residue order. How do the nucleotides know to hook up in a prescribed order to form the codons for the particular peptides? You need the information coding. 
That video addressed nothing about where the information coding came from. Nothing. Why? Why not? Because there's no answer to that. That's why. And without that, the story stops dead in its tracks. The RNA prepared on clays are not what the video suggests. Even with extreme human interference, you didn't get what he would want. So the storytelling should again end here. Yet it presses on in the video. He goes on, 3824, then the cited video says, Ribozymes are RNA molecules with catalytic function. This means that beyond merely serving as genetic material, they can catalyze chemical reactions, including the production of other molecules, such as proteins. And in fact, our own ribosomes are ribozymes which perform precisely this function. Ribozymes can even perform self-replication. That's right, already at this simple level, we are introducing the possibility of self-replication. In this case, via autocatalysis, thereby introducing the possibility of a form of natural selection, whereby chance alterations in molecular structure that raise the statistical likelihood of the proliferation of the molecule will cause that molecule to propagate with greater frequency. Well, let's look into that. It was suggested that ribozymes are RNA molecules with catalytic function. Yes, they are. But nobody has ever made a ribozyme from a random polymerization of nucleotides on hot clay or any other random polymerization. So nobody has ever made a ribozyme in a prebiotically relevant manner. Nor has anyone ever made the homochiral nucleotides, the building blocks of the RNA, nor the homochiral sugars, the building blocks of the nucleotides in the prebiotically relevant manner. Why suggest that a prebiotic earth can do this if it cannot even be done in a modern laboratory using prebiotically relevant roots? Recall the deleterious two prime, five prime linkages? What happened to those? And there were no selectors. Fanciful suggestions being made in the video are irrelevant. At 3828, it was said, This means that beyond merely serving as genetic material, they can catalyze chemical reactions, including the production of other molecules, such as proteins. There can be no production of proteins without codons, without the information being there. One needs proper codes for protein production, plus an array of supporting enzymes to deliver the amino acids, plus the amino acids in the first place, all in homochiral form. And the presenter has not provided any of this yet. At 3836. And in fact, our own ribosomes are ribozymes which perform precisely this function. Yes, because our own ribozymes are of biotic, not prebiotic origin, and they possess the informational code. None of what was suggested has any of these features. None of what was suggested in that video. Thirty-eight forty-three. it was said, Ribozymes can even perform self-replication. That's right, already at this simple level, we are introducing the possibility of self-replication. You mean self-replication that's never been shown to work even though enormous synthetic expertise has been applied? And RNA, after being primed by biochemists, has never been known to copy more than 7% of itself? That's not self-replication. And, and the new copy is too short to ever act as a new template for self-replication. There's two references in the literature. So how did this happen on an early earth when biochemists can't even get it to work on a primed RNA that's set up to do this? At 3845, we are introducing the possibility of self-replication. In this case, via autocatalysis, thereby introducing the possibility of a form of natural selection, whereby chance alterations in molecular structure that raise the statistical likelihood of the proliferation of the molecule will cause that molecule to propagate with greater frequency. Have you any example of this outside of a biological system? Any example? No? No references are provided? Not only has it never been demonstrated, but there's no legitimate hypothesis on the table as to how this could have been done. It was just thrown out there. You see the pain that this causes people when they know what's going on and they hear comments like that on a video? <clears throat> then he goes to the RNA world hypothesis <clears throat> and he shows 
each of these subcategories, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five, and these things. We will deal with all of these in the next slide, but here it, it was said at 3910. The widely accepted RNA world hypothesis postulates that RNA molecules performed all manner of catalytic activity and that proteins only later took over this functionality, which they were able to perform with more versatility. And this was a major step towards the origin of life. Well, I'll tell you, not everybody agrees with the RNA hypothesis. It is just a hypothesis. For example, here is a recent article by Krishnamurthy, who's a leading researcher in the field of origin of life. And here's what he says in that article, quote, the view that the deoxynucleosides would have been available alongside the ribonucleosides, though old, is not as widely popular as the RNA world hypothesis. However, it must be pointed out that the RNA-centric view and the RNA-only approach is limited in its validity and has been rightfully questioned critically. So you see that this is not nearly as widely accepted, and it throws out lots of things that have never even been seen. Quote, RNA forms from inorganic sources, unquote. That has never been shown, not even close, and surely not with homochiral nucleotides. And why doesn't it decompose? Why don't you have to deal with, have to de deal with the decomposition problem when you're dealing with RNA? Step two, quote, RNA self-replicates, unquote. In the best of cases in a modern lab, with all provided with provided homochiral nucleotides, not more than 7% of a primed RNA has been shown to self-replicate. And that was further too short to act as a replication template itself. If it's a ribosome, there's never been a demonstrated protein-free ribosome. Step three, quote, RNA catalyzes protein synthesis, unquote, only if provided the homochiral amino acids with support enzymes and only if the RNA has been given the information to form a codon pattern with the start and stop data. Step four, quote, membrane formation changes internal chemistry, allowing new functionality, unquote. A lipid bilayer vesicle can change subsequent protein folding, but there are so many outstanding questions since no phospholipid bilayer has yet been suggested, and the protein folding is a big unknown. We're going to look at the Leventhal paradox in just a moment. Quote, un step five, quote, RNA codes both DNA and proteins, unquote. But where'd the RNA get the informational code to begin with? And from where did the homochiral nucleotide arise? You see, every time you skip one of these steps, it, it just cuts, cuts the knees, right? Cuts you right off at the knees. Quote, DNA becomes the master template, unquote. Yes, it is a master template. But in the video's proposal, it is only what the strand of DNR uh, only what the strand of RNA gave it, and nothing more. What's the informational source? Quote, proteins catalyze cellular activity, unquote. This is true, but they require pools of homochiral amino acids and support enzymes to do all of this. From where did those arise? It was suggested that, as it says here, the mineral surfaces could perform organometallic catalysis. And what he shows here is a condensation polymerization taking place in water. Proteins depolymerize in water faster than they polymerize. Then it was suggested at 13 minutes and 29 seconds. With regards to protein production, if catalysis via ribozymes is deemed insufficient, there are plenty of other possibilities. Hydrothermal vents or volcanic hot springs could have provided the energy required for the polymerization reactions. But my personal favorite explanation involves heterogeneous catalysis over mineral-rich surfaces in tidal pools. The small volume of the pools solves the problem of molecules having to find each other in the ocean, acting essentially like a chemist's flask in a laboratory. How does one get the chemicals in the oceans needed for the reactions in those, into those small pools? That's not yet been shown. Where would all these small molecules come from? You said it's no problem, but I don't believe it. You've got to show me where they come from. And even if you had them, how do you perform the needed condensation reactions in water? In the water reactions, you would favor the starting material. Amino acids don't even just hook together like that. Even in the chemist's flask in a laboratory, even the chemist can't get them to hook together like that. And how about the side chain protection and deprotection? Side chains are more reactive than the amine itself, than the alpha amine itself. 
But if you don't want to take my word for it, that the amino acids don't just hook together in aqueous solution, even in a chemist's flask, how about what was published in Nature in 2019 by Matthew Pounder, a key person in origin of life research. And uh, uh, he says this, it is inconceivable, it is inconceivable that sophisticated and coordinated macromolecules could suddenly emerge at the origin of life, unquote. He goes on to say, quote, peptides are widely assumed to be products of amino acid polymerization reactions. Whilst conceptually simple, in practice these are, there are good reasons why these reactions are inefficient in water. And then he goes on to explain why these are zwitterionic, and these don't happen in water. just hasn't, hasn't been shown. So how can you keep claiming this? You throw all the organometallic surfaces you want at it. It's not going to happen. So I don't know why that's your favorite place to have it happen when it doesn't happen there. So the video storytelling should end right there. Because if, if you can't get past this point in Origin of Life, you can't go on. But it presses on. Then it says in 3958, But more importantly, the mineral surfaces could have acted as naturally occurring organometallic catalysts. These surfaces may have not only performed efficient syntheses, well, maybe Professor Pounder should watch the video to learn that there are organometallic catalysts that can cause efficient synthesis of peptides from amino acids and from amino acids with active side chains. And then maybe he should just retract his article from Nature because it's all wrong based on what this video had talked about that we're citing. Yet the video presses on at 40.04. But given the possibility of the surfaces exhibiting chirality, it could have been the case that they preferentially reacted with one particular enantiomeric version of molecules, like perhaps only L-amino acids. This would readily explain their prevalence in proteins, with enzymes arising later to perpetuate the stereochemical bias after their dominance had already been set into place. This would readily, readily explain their prevalence in proteins, with enzymes arising later to perpetuate the stereochemical bias. Is there any example of a chiral, sur chiral surface showing a high selectivity of one enantiomer for polymerization over others, over a broad class of compounds like that of 19 racemic amino acids? No. Also, does anyone deal with the side chain problem? The amino acid side chains are often more reactive than the alpha amine and the primary carboxylate. Every statement made in the video is painful when considering the synthetic chemistry involved. Again, I'm not picking on anyone's other videos, but no chemistry, no, no chemical understanding was in that video that we're referencing. Just utterly, utterly ridiculous. 4035 claimed, and then came the claim. There are other ways to get enantiomeric excess with the amino acids themselves. It has been demonstrated that recrystallization of a mixture of amino acids... And then he goes on and he talks about that, that reaction, that, that supernatant being one enantiomer and that crystal being another. I've already dealt with that. And it was not a slight excess, it was a 700% excess. You call that slight? 700% excess. Not 7%, 700%. To get a homochiral seed, and, and and of the homochiral seed, and now what you had to do is you had to, in that homochiral seed of, of 700 percent, only one percent of what was in that was what you wanted, and of that it was only 22 percent EE. So so it's it's just just really really crazy. Um, uh, uh, anyway. So concerning homochirality, it was further said at 4108. So we can see that the chirality of biomolecules may have been implemented at any number of places throughout the process of abiogenesis. Video has not shown a single viable place where homochirality might have been introduced to amino acids or how they could have polymerized. So it's not yet proposed a viable enzyme synthesis. And it's not shown where the homochirality in the sugars has arisen and, they were, and how they were polymerized with regiochemical and anomeric stereochemical control. Massive control problems in the polymerization of, of uh, sugars. And you just skip that because you can have trillions and trillions of different isomers hooking together. 
and it was not shown how nucleic acids with stereochemical control or how they would polymerize avoiding the two five linkages and it was not and it is it has not been shown how they would be stable from rapid degradation through two prime hydroxyl intramolecular attack on the phosphate, nor how the RNA could be stored at minus 80 degrees centigrade or minus 112 degrees Fahrenheit to prevent the rapid decomposition, nor, how, nor has it been shown uh, lipids with their homochiral control, select, uh, control selecting the proper enantiotopic hydroxymethyl, uh, which we talked about that in the lipid section. You had to select those. Yet, here's the claim of victory over homochirality. When he says, you see, chirality could have been induced of any, at any of these points, how can you claim victory on the homochirality problem when you haven't shown anything? Oh, the nonsensical and unfounded claims. The storytelling should stop right here, but it presses on. Then there's the claim at 4117. From here, biopolymers need to assemble into some kind of rudimentary organized structure. This is nowhere near as far-fetched as science deniers make it out to be. First, the system needs a boundary. Luckily, amphiphilic lipids spontaneously form ordered structures. And then 4144, quote, Although in prebiotic absence of phospholipids, the first membranes can have been bilayers or even monolayers of fatty acids or other simple lipids that can easily have arisen spontaneously. Easily, spontaneously, fatty acids do not arise spontaneously. Fischer-Trope type syntheses in hydrothermal vents and glycoaldehyde proposed prebiotic roots have never been confirmed to show formation of fatty acids in any prebiotic sense. All that's known today is that fatty acids are products of biological processes. Again, this word spontaneously here is a code word for we have no idea. So every time they throw out the word spontaneously means, how did a fatty acid form spontaneously? T show me how that happened from methane. I would love to see that. Oh, you haven't an answer? Okay. And I'm the science denier? No, I'm not denying science. I'm using and supporting science. I'm denying nonsensical claims. You see the trick here? One just says it's easy and it's spontaneous. And then they quickly press on to the next chapter in the storytelling. Every one of these is a hard problem with no demonstrated prebiotically relevant solution. In a modern lab, outside a biological system, let alone under a rock someplace. None of this has been solved. And even if the fatty acid could somehow form, would it be sufficient to form a lipid bilayer? No. Neil Deveraj writes in Nature Chemistry in November 2020, he wrote, quote, all living organisms harness prot proton gradients across phospholipid membranes to generate energy. Vesicles formed from simpler amphiphiles such as fatty acids are unable to maintain proton gradients, suggesting that diacyl phospholipid membranes appeared early in the origin of life. You can't do it with just fatty acids. That video that we're citing was wrong again. So there's no phospholipid bilayer because there are no fatty acids. Now what? Stuck again. The storytelling should end, end right here, but it doesn't. Some further say, 42.06. So we can begin to imagine bilayers forming around a collection of biomolecules, including RNA and proteins. No, I can't imagine that. Can't imagine that. I don't know where you got the nucleotide. I don't know where you got the sugar for the nucleotide. I don't know how it polymerized. I don't know where you got the homochiral amino acids. And even if you had those, I don't know how they polymerized. So I can't imagine that. And more is said at 4210. This allowed for the emergence of hypercycles, which are organizations of self-replicating macromolecules connected in a cyclic manner, where each catalyzes the synthesis of its successor in addition to itself, with the last one looping back to the first. This is not strictly hypothetical. Do they mean strictly hypothetical like everything else they've shown? 4214. The emergence of a cooperative network of self-assembling ribozymes was demonstrated in 2012. No. Without a purification mechanism with, in place, this would rapidly make vast arrays of impurities that would also start replicating. This cannot work. 
I wish the reference were provided to the claimed article so we could see what's going on there. And how about as, as, as for your hypercycles? Look what Leslie Orgel wrote. He is one of the biggest names in origin of life research in the 20th century. He's, he's, he's no longer alive, but he wrote uh, this article for the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in the year 2000. Quote, Non-covalent interactions between small molecules and aqueous solution are generally too weak to permit large and regiospecific catalytic accelerations. To postulate one fortuitously catalyzed reaction, perhaps catalyzed by a metal ion, might be reasonable. But to postulate a suite of them is to appeal to magic. That's an origin of life researcher saying you appeal to magic. And it was finally said at 4245, from here, it's not that large a leap in complexity to get to some kind of protobiont or protocell, where some rudimentary metabolism is taking place, and other more primitive versions of cellular functions begin to emerge. So-called Jiwanu protocells with basic metabolic capabilities have been synthesized in labs as early as the 1960s. All that is left to get to early prokaryotic life is natural selection and time. It's interesting that the cited video relates back to Jiwanu protocells of 1963, thereby underscoring my point that little progress has been made for 60 plus years. That video itself goes back to 1963. But more to the point, no, there have never been metabolisms demonstrated. Just any old chemical reaction is not a metabolism. What is a metabolism? Here's Britannica Encyclopedia definition. Quote, metabolism is the sum of the chemical reactions that take place within a cell of a living organism and that provide energy for vital processes and for synthesizing new organic materials. Living organisms are unique in that they can extract energy from their environment and use it to carry out activities such as movement, growth, and development, and reproduction. But how do living organisms or their cells extract energy from their environments? And how do cells use this energy to synthesize and assemble the components from which the cells are made? The answers to these questions lie in the enzyme-mediated chemical reactions that take place in living matter, metabolism. I didn't write that, that's, that's still quoting. Hundreds of coordinated multi-step reactions fueled by energy obtained from nutrients and or solar energy ultimately convert readily available materials into the molecules required for growth and maintenance, unquote. Never has metabolism been demonstrated in a protocell. That video that we're citing was wrong again. Hence, this cell assembly story is stopped dead in its tracks. It should stop right here. Well, that wraps up part one on constructing a cell, the assembly problem. Tune in to part two and we'll pick up where we left off. We remain clueless on life's origin. Thanks for joining us. If you want to subscribe, you just click right here, subscribe, and we'll give you a shout out when the next video in this series comes out.